All right, well, uh, good afternoon. Our topic is going to be the triple aim. Um, and what we'll do is look at what the triple aim is. We'll talk about how, from a physician standpoint, a practice or a physician, what they need to be looking at in terms of preparation um, and how that might align as far as the triple aim is concerned. So um, why don't we get to know each other first? And Robert, you've shared with us you're a physician. Bob Ashley, I'm a family physician from Gainesville, Florida. Well, I'm David Todd, and I'm an office supply sales rep uh, in Orlando, Florida. But work with physicians' practices, as I learned earlier. Yes, sir. That's one of your lines uh, of work. One of, yes, one of my focuses is on the, uh, the health care and health facilities. All right. Let me, let me start out by asking, do you know what the triple aim is? Or you're just adventurous today and signed up? I think I probably have a good idea of what the triple aim is, in that uh, in health care costs, a small percentage of the people you account for a very high dollar amount of our health care costs. Uh, and trying to make sure we provide most appropriate use of health care dollars mm -hmm. and that we achieve high quality, looking at quality, patient satisfaction, and savings are what I would think the triple A aim it. is. You've got it. Uh, I, I have previously served as the uh, medical director of our local accountable care organization. Okay, good. So we have a triple aim. Great, terrific. That was a good description, and let me, I'm going to go ahead and put it up on the, the board anyway, just so we have something to refer back to. Um, so the three pieces, one is population health. How are we going to move from taking care of individuals who are sick to uh, getting in front of it and having a responsibility for a defined population and moving toward preventive or health-focused medicine of keeping those individuals well. So we'll put that up here as population health. The uh, next one, Bob, to your point, is the patient experience itself. You know, what are we doing from the standpoint of service satisfaction? Uh, what are we doing in terms of um, any required uh, monitoring of the, the outcomes of those individuals' health? Um, so that's the patient, I'm going to put down patient experience for the third, the second piece. And then the third piece is, I think, and again, you mentioned it, is probably the most difficult, and that's per capita, lower the per capita cost of care. So we'll put up per capita cost. And I think, you know, a lot's happening here. Certainly a lot's happening here, down here, I think probably, would you agree, is one of the major issues of how to reduce the cost of the system. And um, I heard someone from the state of Florida on a Florida Blue panel about a year and a half ago in Orlando, and this was the guy that was working with the state of Florida, so you have to understand under Republican administration, but he said the most misnamed legislation ever passed was the Affordable Care Act because it does nothing to make care more affordable. It didn't impact the medical liability side of it, the malpractice at all. It did nothing to curb that. Um, and it really didn't address, it was really more of a focus on changing insurance and, and other things and not focused on reducing the cost of care. So um, despite its name, the interest that we have in it, um, first of all, let me get a little quick background on myself. Um, I'm the executive director of the Health Council of East Central Florida. There are 11 health councils in the state of Florida. In fact, one is in Gainesville. That's Well, Florida. Um, they, you, must, you must know Sandra. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, and, and Kendra and Jeff Feller and others up there. Um, in fact, we're doing some work with them um, to work closer together. Um, these were formed in the 1980s, but their purpose, every one of them looks completely different. Um, Jeff does 94, 95% of his business up there. Well, Florida does work with state-funded uh, initiatives, um, a lot in the area of community IT, on the, uh, some of the things they've been doing there, um, a lot in Healthy Start and others. We, on the other hand, have focused very much on program evaluation down here, program development, uh, but we're now growing more and more into the area of population health. That's now in our mission statement. Um, and we're working with organizations and the community to try and figure out how, for the uninsured in the four counties we cover, Orange, Seminole, Osceola, and Brevard, how we can develop and strengthen the safety system and have it um, achieve or leverage the resources we have to have it uh, cover more individuals. Um, so we're really looking very much at this population health piece 
um, in terms of what is the role of technology, what are some of the things we can do to expand the, the numbers of individuals that are going to require care within this because we know that with the state's decision so far, the state legislature's decision not to expand Medicaid, that there's a huge population still that are using the free clinics. And in fact, that's even growing to a certain extent. Even on a national level, though, if you look at the forecast when the AMA, the American Hospital Association, and others agreed to go along with the Affordable Care Act, they agreed to that under the premise that everyone would be covered. But as soon as the uh, Supreme Court made the decision that states could decide yay or nay to do that, the end result moved from, I believe, the focus had been down to about 8 million uninsured in the U.S. It, the last I heard from HHS was the number was back up around 30 million uninsured across the country. So you still have a huge population uninsured uh, despite the, uh, the act itself. So back on triple aim. Um, Don Berwick, uh, I believe, is a pedi pediatric physician from Boston, and a number of years ago, he developed an organization called the IHI, or Institute for Health Improvement, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. One of the things that this group did was focus on health improvement. That's their, that's their goal. But one of the things they did is they came up with this concept called the Triple Aim, and this is where this first came from. Well, then the Obama administration came along and picked um, and asked Don Berwick to come down and run CMS, run Medicare and Medicaid, which he did for a period of time. I don't remember, maybe a year and a half, two years, something like that. While he was there, the administration picked up the idea of the triple aim and ran with it. And so as I was sharing with you at the break room, that has now become the overall direction for uh, health care in the country. And in fact, Florida Hospital, headquartered here in Orlando, the Adventist Health System, but with hospitals throughout the state of Florida and elsewhere across the country, actually is building their strategic plan around the three elements of the triple aim. So the premise today in talking on this, when I was asked to speak, I said, okay, so how does this apply to physicians' practices? And as we look at this, what, what will need to be done by, to, to bring the physician component you know, into, this, uh, into this equation? So I want to back up for a minute and, and share a diagram with you that when I came to the Health Council in the end of 2010, um, I drew this diagram. I drew it um, just as you see it here with, um, basically, uh, let's see, three elements behind it at the time when we added the fourth. Um, and what we said is that there's an opportunity. If you look at this as the healthcare spending going on in Central Florida, or the healthcare system, you'll notice that the further you go up, the more it costs. So you can imagine, what is this H, the most expensive place to treat somebody, the hospital, right? It also, if you think about it, and I spent, as I was sharing with you, probably, I don't know, 15 years as hospital administration, we viewed the world revolves around the hospital. But once you get away from that, you realize that really there's so much going on below that and much greater use, and that's in specialty services. That could be secondary, could be outpatient, could be specialist physicians, and of course this is the primary physicians. And look at the amount of use of that. All of us use our primary care delivery model far more than we do the hospital. Now there was one other here, and I'd be interested about your thought. Who, what do you think is before primary care? All of the naturalist, uh, other, uh, and well, well self-treatment and pharma. Self-treatment. Self self-treatment, self yeah. uh, uh, other integrative, Spending, uh, exactly. Supplements, uh, yep. Copper, copper bracelets and whatever. Yep. All these things that that can be done. But in, if you look here, though, there is an opportunity. In fact, Intel and IBM uh, got together and, and were quoted. Probably now it's been five or six years. And then I heard the same quote about two years ago from them. Um, and they truly believe, uh, actually it might have been Intel and GE, they believe that 50% of healthcare will be provided in the home by 2020. So I put home down, these are all provider, you know, or types of providers and the home is not providing, but the home is where we're gonna see more and more done. And the technology, the so-called mHealth, um, the ability now to do live monitoring, and if you've watched Daniel Craig's, uh, Crafts, rather, um, and if you haven't, uh, if you get a chance, watch, are you familiar with TED Talks? TED, TED Talks. 
Yeah. Uh, I will have a monitor in my office for home use next week. Well, there you are. Okay. Uh, it is, is every bit as reliable and sophisticated as the monitor you have in the ICU. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and a and fraction of the cost. Send information to me by Wi-Fi. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we're working with a company on, on something called Sensor Health. Um, basically, a lot of the Qualcomm phones now have the ability to receive Bluetooth information from a sensor, either an implanted sensor or a sensor you're wearing, right, through there, and then your phone reporting that information out. So we have the ability to actually in live time impact when your phone buzzes and says, listen, you're a diabetic and your blood sugar is now out of range and this is what you need to do right away. And it's a self-monitoring system. So um, uh, amazing. I just spent some time yesterday with a physician who um, does is huge business in the e-triage area, but now they're moving into chronic care management and giving patients the ability to monitor and then not only monitor, but what, based on what their most recent evaluation is, they get education sent to them that specifically relates to that and they get a score. And the goal is, as they take courses, is see if they can get their score closer to 100 percent. So we're, we're using game theory, we're using an awful lot of different ways to in, in, involve people. So part of this is having available liter literacy, improving the literacy of individuals, and I think the bigger issue is behavior. We all know what we should be doing, it's not necessarily what we do. And I'm working with the uh, psychology school at FIT uh, in Melbourne, looking at ways that we can in some way encourage and find ways to make patients more engaged in their own care, because that's what we're going to need to do, because, Bob, you know, I mean, you tell patients what they should be doing, but do they all comply? I Probably not, <laughs> you know, or at least, at least not as much as you'd like to see it. So this is the model. The reason I, I added this later is I'm on the board of the PCAN group here, which is Primary Care Access Network for the Uninsured in Central Florida. And they were focusing on how do we expand this piece, especially with patient-centered medical homes. How do we expand the number of access points? But there's a practical limitation going on here, and that's the total number of physicians coming out of the um, training programs. And we're forecast, and I can't tell you primary care, but I know overall to be 90,000 physicians short by 2020. So we have to begin to look at team approaches where a physician leads a team of providers. And so what we said here is don't stop here. Let's go ahead and look down here and see what we can do to reduce the demand or to look at who it is that should be seeing their primary care physician so that the primary care physicians can focus based on their knowledge and their skill set and operate at the highest level of their license and their ability um, as opposed to doing a lot of routine things that may be done by medical assistants, um, nurses and others in the, in the practice. Um, and we'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in just a minute because Bob, you mentioned uh, stratification and that's one of the other areas I want to talk about. So anyway, looking at this, um, your practice is, and I'm so glad you're here because it's so much easier talking to a physician about something than, you know, um, people that aren't in that area. And I'm, I, I don't mean that in a negative sense, but we can do some real test here. Ken, Ken, I would offer, we should be glad that David is here because he's a consumer. Well, that's true. Uh, that, that, exactly. That, that, that this is team. This is the whole concept of our care of the future is team, and team includes the patient. And that, how can that, we that, get that, David to that? that it's, it's engagement, engage. and, and, yeah, and yeah. That, that it has to be uh, considered all people in this together. It's not physician directed, hospital directed. It has to be team work in order to achieve our triple aim. Perfect. So glad you said that. That's great. Out of curiosity, are you, is your uh, practice pure fee-for-service? Do you have any risk contracts? I do not have any risk contracts. Uh, it's strictly fee-for-service. I'm in solo practice. And solo to me until two years ago meant solo. I was in this alone. I had my nurse and a medical assistant in the front office today. My team includes a part-time physician assistant two days a week, a nurse practitioner one half day a week who helps me with my gynecologic care, a part-time 
dietitian who does my medical nutritional therapy, a diabetic clinical educator that's there half day every other week, and more recently adding a social worker who will be there a day uh, a week, and a respiratory therapist who will help me as needed, and I anticipate having a trainer or an exercise physiologist very soon. So you really are moving, just as we've talked about, a physician-led team where you don't have to do all those things and you have specialty specialists coming. Particularly it is moving that it is behavioral therapy. It's behavioral and not pharmacologic. Pharmacology plays a role, but behavior is a huge, huge part, and I cannot change behavior enough. Just like we were talking, right, exactly. So getting people involved. Well, looking at this, um, that brings in the whole area, the first area of population health, and that is the movement that's taking place of uh, very much fee-for-service to the whole area of what we're calling value. So we're going from volume to value care in the terminology. Um, in fact, I was sharing with David that um, uh, today I'm finishing up, we're working with a physician in the community, and we're developing content for a national webinar teaching physicians what to look for for their movement into population health and risk contracting. Um, and uh, I had, uh, for a period of time, um, been working with a physician group from back in 1989 up until they sold this year, a uh, group of 10, uh, uh, 10 or 15 physicians, primary care, um, very much in the area of Medicare Advantage. So obviously um, focusing on global capitation or as we were talking, I think prepaid care. Um, and uh, all indications are this, the health system itself is pushing us in that direction. Um, there's a program called the ACE program that Medicare was testing in the Southwest United States for a number of years. Um, that developed or created the opportunity for what we call bundle care. And bundle care is where um, for a particular episode or, or type of care, everything is inclusive and it's billed as one package. So instead of going into the hospital, let's use maybe hip replacement as an example, and you've got uh, the surgeon, obviously, you've got the hospital charges, you've got uh, radi radiology uh, for your imaging, uh, you, uh, you know, maybe it was an, there was an emergency that got you in there in the first place. So you've got all of these separate bills. This looks at one um, one bundle, if you will, and then your organizations or your health systems will compete against each other for these bundles. Um, we saw this up in Geisinger in Pennsylvania with what's called proven care for cardiac, and then they included a six-month period after the actual process is done to ensure that during that six months, um, if something happens, they take care of it at no extra charge to you or to your insurance company. Um, so this is a, a new model. It's one of the models that's coming along. So um, what we're seeing is, again, more of a focus from fee-for-service to um, this risk medicine, uh, putting physicians at risk um, as part of the, this. And if they're going to do that, then there's the expectation of being able to manage the population that they have. So in your case, it would be whatever your patient panel is, um, or if you were a group, um, and you were handling Medicare Advantage, then you're defined by the number of members from that health plan that you're going to take care of in the course of a, a year. And the individuals themselves in Medicare Advantage um, actually elect you because they're given an opportunity to sign up and select a physician under a plan. So if the practice accepts Humana health plans, then anybody that signs up with the Amana can say, okay, I want to be Dr. Vias patient, I want to be Dr. Smith's patient, whoever it is that they want. So you can't choose, and so whatever acuity they have, whatever illnesses and chronic conditions they have, they bring with them and you have to manage that. So it's, um, there was a time, I think you'll agree, that uh, Medicare Plus Choice, the joke used to be that if they were enrolling older individuals into these plans, these risk plans, they would always hold the meetings on the second floor of a meeting hall that didn't have an elevator because that meant the people had to be in good enough condition to be able to get up to the second floor to enroll. 
Uh, that was the story anyway. I don't know what your experience was. But um, so then it was selective. It was cherry picking, you know, the healthiest for the plan, but you can't do that anymore. And so as a result, um, you know, it's, it, there's a great deal of learning necessary to figure out how to manage the care of these individuals. If you have um, an episode where somebody re requires a major con uh, work done, you have to carry stop loss insurance, which uh, limits your, your exposure to a certain point of risk, and then your insurance kicks in after that. But the point here is that um, we're moving from this whole area of fee-for-service, generally a fee-for-service practice, to one that is prepaid, but that puts the risk on the physician then to be able to manage the health of that defined population. So that's how we get to population health. Would you agree with any, and please feel free because um, I, I value your input and I haven't asked you your opinion on risk, uh, but. And to some degree, the accountable care organization was at risk. Uh, yes. Yeah, that that it had gain that. risk, uh, but not loss risk in the, in the right. model that that was, is, we, is we yours a Medicare with, with, uh, ACL? Accountable mm -hmm. care and, and okay. Medicare. Uh, looked at risk models mm -hmm. uh, that uh, not quite ready to take on risk as a solo person. There's also direct uh, patient care where the insurance companies are really not involved. I guess this is taking provider groups going directly to user groups and cutting out. See, I would love to see man. that in the state, Bob. I'd love to see us move in that direction. The problem is the state of Florida doesn't allow it. If you're accepting payment in advance on a prepay model outside of the insurance, it's basically against the insurance regulations. Now, you, are you familiar with PHCs, prepaid health clinic models? Yes. Okay. And when I was, um, I had a health insurance agency here for a while in Orlando, and I went down to South Florida where there were, I think, six PHCs licensed down there, hooked up with one pro medical plan, and brought it to Central Florida because we wanted to allow individuals to be able to prepay for routine care um, so that they'd always have it available to them, and you just pay on a monthly basis and you have this care. Now, there is a copay that you have to pay, but it's very low when you go into the practice. But it didn't go like it's going down in South Florida. You know, one, it's not an insurance product as such. There's really no risk um, to the insurance company, so the costs are very, very low for it. Um, and but on the same time, um, it doesn't also require any type of social security number. So it's big down in South Florida, where you have a lot of people without social security numbers who don't want to share it. Um, and that seems to be where it's been successful down there. It really didn't do much up here. There are programs like Q-Lions in Washington State, uh, which is a prepaid model where it's allowed there where people pay maybe $70, $80 a month, and they have access to a direct physician primary preventive medicine group, and you don't have the insurance. Then what you do is, and Q-Lions will be the first to tell you, is you buy a catastrophic policy that kicks in and covers basically your hospitalization or your major expenses that are up on this end. So what you're doing is on a, on a monthly basis, you're prepaying your access into the primary model. They've been very successful with venture capital. I think their last uh, funding round, they got seven or eight million dollars to expand Q-Lions out there. I would, I've talked to insurance companies that would love to see that here in Florida as another option. Um, I will share with you something I just told the woman out in the hall. She got a kick out of this. There's a practice locally that they're not allowed to, again, without an insurance license. And to get the license in the state, I think you've got to have about a million and a half dollars sitting in an account you know, for Tallahassee to be satisfied. The idea is that as a physician, you can't be trusted to provide the care that you're prepaid for. That's basically what the state is saying, unfortunately, to, uh, to providers. So um, what this physician does locally is she charges on a monthly basis. She just charges at the end of the month instead of before. So she's always behind. So she's not pre, your, her attorney said, you're not prepaying for the care. You're paying for it afterward. So there's an idea for you. <laughs> Have them pay every month, but they pay at the end of the month instead of beforehand. Um, that's an area that we're um, working on right now. We're, as I say, we're getting ready to do this national webinar to, to work with physicians and physicians' practices to see where they are in terms of their ability and their willingness and their focus on moving to a risk uh, type approach of care. 
And then based on what we learned during that webinar, we'll be looking at doing physician education for physicians and, and courses through this network of on-site uh, educators they have in all 50 states. So um, we figure it's, it's, I've talked to a lot of physicians and the feedback was this is something that's necessary because even if we don't want to go there yet, we need to know what we will need when we go in that direction in terms of protecting our own practices and, and other things. Next area is um, risk stratification. Oh, on the timetable on volunteer to val volume to value, um, there was a survey, a national survey done just recently by McKesson, and their indication is that we're going to see fee-for-service drop very rapidly. Uh, I had the numbers this morning I was looking at. I want to say it's 56% right now of the volume that a physician does generally, globally, is fee-for-service medicine. So when you go to see the physician, when you go to see Bob, you pay him at that time or your insurance pays him for that. Where we're going is again with this uh, value care is they're saying in two years from now we'll see that drop from about 56 percent down into the 40 mid 40s I believe it is and then they expect in five years to be down to about 30 percent. So you're going to see very rapid movement based on the survey that was done of physicians and others throughout the country on that. How does it work if I'm on the, the, the what's the opposite Mm -hmm. I guess we both pay, right? I pay him my copay, and my insurance company pays him. Right. That's traditional fee for service. Bob only gets paid when you actually come to him. The actual na national average I was looking at the other day is about 3.2 visits per year. I think is the national average. On so you, you'll probably see Bob three times or three and a half times in the year, based again on your health condition and so forth, as an average. And so he's only going to get paid for each time that you actually go see him. Now, if he gets on a, one of these uh, insurance contracts, he's paid on a PMPM, or per member per month basis. So you're now a member of his practice. But then, if you are the payor, my per member per month is going to vary according to the quality that I render over time. Yes. That you're going to say, you're, we started you in 2000. We started you in 2014 and we gave you $10 a month and we haven't seen any improvement in our population and you're still going to get $10 per member per month or in the next year and say well we've seen improvement in the index of the disease burden in your practice has gone up and your score of quality has improved, you're now worth $20 per member per month. So you can have the support services in place to provide additional services, so hopefully you will be even more effective next year. Good, a great example. Let me, let me go back history for a moment. Medicare plus choice was this model. Today we call it Medicare Advantage. Under Medicare plus choice, a lot of physicians, in fact, that, and I don't know whether you've heard this term or not, but co uh, capitation was called the cocaine of medicine. Because once you get on capitation payments as a physician practice, you're getting paid every month whether or not David comes in to see Bob or not. Okay? Bob's still getting a check. Now, the problem was that a lot of physicians took advantage of that and said, hey, this is great. I've got good cash flow. You know, if David never comes in, that's fine by me. There were no, there were no real controls at that time forcing or encouraging Bob to call, or his practice to call you and say, David, come in anyway. It's time for your annual physical. I want to make sure you get your flu shot and other things. Nowadays, there are, and that's part of this piece over here, is things called HEDIS and health plans are basically rated based on how compliant they are and, or how, uh, how they work with their physician, making sure that you're seen and when you're healthy. And the reason is because it costs Bob, costs the practice more money. If you're not seen when you're healthy or when you're beginning to get sick, the more acute or the sicker you get, the more it's going to end up costing Bob out of his practice. And so that's, uh, that's changed and we see a lot more compliance, although it's not 100%. There's not a week, or almost every day, there's something that comes from an insurer with a message that someone has not filled a prescription or something is delayed in one of their quality indicators 
or a medication might be overused or something that is questioning the quality and an opportunity. Uh, can be viewed in several different ways. Uh, sometimes it, it may be hit you at an annoying moment and other times it may better hit you as an opportunity, but they're coming regularly uh, both from benefit managers, uh, HEDIS criteria, and the other force out there is the activity of the health insurance and accountable care to survey the population and recognize the unmet need. Right. And there again, so that you're being treated when you're healthy as opposed to when you're sick. And, and Bob is still being paid under that model, under a, under a value model, he's still being paid to again see you and encourage you to come in, not because he's gonna get paid when you come in, but because he's getting paid globally and wants to make sure you stay healthy. To my knowledge, capitation ended not over the quality issue, but over the amount of payment that was being redirected to physicians. Mm -hmm. That uh, too great a share uh, was g going back to physicians. That the data showed that utilization, particularly in hospital days, uh, was dropping very rapidly and that the gap was too rich for doctors, and so capitation ended. And, and in many cases it did, and we've seen that because we, we, however, today, just to give you an idea, I want to say we're up to nationally 10 to, I think it's closer to 12 or 15 percent of the Medicare enrollees are getting, are enrolled in what's called Part C, which is Medicare Advantage of, of Medicare. And I'm amazed because I live in a, a nice area of the community that happens to be very near a very affluent community. That's Islesworth, Windermere. It's about a mile and a half, two miles down the road from me. Um, that's where Tiger Woods had his home, where he went into the mailbox. We won't get into that today. But anyway, what happened is I've got a friend who lives in Islesworth, uh, goes to our church, and she came to me recently. She's about 68, 69, and she said, okay, you know, I've been paying for this Medicare supplemental fee because I've got traditional Medicare. Um, everybody I'm talking to and her friends, very well-to-do, are looking at Medicare Advantage all of a sudden. So we're seeing a, a great deal of interest now in individuals who before viewed Medicare Advantage as something that you got when you couldn't afford to get Medicare and a supplemental policy yourself. Um, so at least in this area, we're seeing constant and continuous growth in the Medicare Advantage product, which is a model that does place the physician practice either at full or partial risk under the capitation model. So, and that's one of the models that we're talking about, risk sharing, pay for performance, bundled care and capitation, all of these things that, that basically allow an insurance company to get a fee from the federal government, in this case, when we're talking about Medicare population, federal government says, okay, you know, Dr. Dr. Jones now has been paid to take care of David. David is in a Medicare Advantage plan, and it's not our problem anymore. It's now Humana's problem or WellCare's problem or whoever the health plan is. The health plan, on the other hand, wants to get that risk shifted as quickly as possible because it really doesn't serve anything for the insurance company to have the dollars. It wants to shift the risk to Bob and people like himself who actually are providing the care and let him take the risk. And so that's the idea is to move it down. You, know, you don't agree or you, or you agree and don't like it? or I'm not a risk taker. Oh, uh, as I'm, I'm saying yeah. that you know everybody wants to put the risk on the low man to endure the risk mm -hmm. when he has, individually, he has, if you went to the banker, the banker would be probably least willing to put a large amount of risk on an individual as opposed to a group. You would divide it so the risk is being shoved to smaller and smaller people rather than held by bigger and bigger groups, which was a concept of what insurance really did. But, but you agree that this is what is being done. And then as a physician, Bob has to make a decision whether or not there's sufficient fee-for-service volume to keep him going, especially as a solo practitioner, and there are not a lot of you left, I, I'm afraid, uh, or whether or not a group or a physician group wants to go ahead and participate in these risk contracts. 
you know, there is one other thing that I can consider in my armamentarium to deal with these is to provide the best service that no one outside can compete. That, that the level that I can, can provide cannot be matched by anybody by, else. By, right. by the competition. Mm -hmm. They can't, maybe somewhere in the future they can, but today they can't mass produce what I can turn out and provide the satisfaction among members, patients, that if I do my best, I can do, yeah. and I can, I can still win. That's the way, you know, independent. We were t actually talking about that. David and I were talking in the break room a little bit earlier about the big box stores versus David who sells individual office supplies directly to organizations. And the thing that he brings that a big box can't is that personal contact, that personal touch, and that ability to deliver precisely what it is that's necessary for that organization to have. So I think you actually have great similarity there in terms of your approach. So. Uh, risk stratification. Um, as organizations are looking at moving, again, toward population health, we're recognizing something which I think is rather interesting uh, going back. The, the most, the first I've heard of this, or the greatest I've heard of this, started in Camden, New Jersey. And it happened a few years ago when one of the police officers in Camden, or police chief, whoever it was, was looking at where crime was occurring in, in Camden. And they noticed that there were types of crimes that were clustered in certain areas of Camden. And if they focused their resources, their police force, on those areas and those types of crime, they could have a difference. Well, there was a physician at around the same time that said, you know, I wonder if that's true of health issues as well. So he started to research in Camden and looked at where were what became known as hot spots. And the terminology now is hot spotting. And so what happened is we next saw that in Atlantic City, New Jersey, where the casinos got together and they said, you know, we're paying too much money to take care of our employees. We have to figure out what's going on here. So they began to study their employees' utilization of health. And they noticed, for example, one gentleman who was constantly in the emergency department for asthma. And they said, well, what is it that's prompting these asthma attacks that ends up driving him to the emergency department in Atlantic City all the time? So they went out and they began to look at the areas and they found out where he lived. And just like you were sharing who you're bringing in, a social worker and people, they sent somebody out to look. And it didn't require a physician, it required the social worker to say, wait a minute, this building has got roaches. There's been no extermination done in here, so that's aggravating his asthma. They either moved him or they fixed that by providing extermination service in the building and the asthma attacks went away and he stopped using the emergency department. So there's a physician now, the guy who's behind this, who's now setting up these focused clinics on extraordinarily you know, acute problems uh, up in New England. I mean, he's got a, a, a brand now that he's going out there and doing. But the point is, we have risk stratification. The County of Seminole pays the Health Council $120,000 a year to manage the population of the, uh, to provide coverage for the uninsured in Seminole County. Every year that covers less because the amount's not changed. So what's happening is we're having to try to find a way to leverage the 120,000. So what we're doing now, in fact, I'll spend all day Wednesday on this, is we're charting how we provide care right now for those individuals that prevent without insurance, present without insurance there. And one of the things we're going to identify is are they high risk, are they medium or rising risk, or are they low risk? Now, the low risk, and uh, the numbers on that, just to give you an idea, and this is national, 60 to 80 percent of the uninsured sit in the low risk category. So this is a really big, again, it's like pyramid model. There's a big population here. Now, if we don't do anything with them at all, uh, well, how are they going to get their care? This tends to be more not chronic care that they're having on an ongoing basis, chronic conditions. It tends to be acute episodes of something. We have on the ground there Shepherd's Hope, which is a free clinic. Um, and so the idea is for these individuals, they probably be, can be handled in the free clinic and then we can provide health education and other things for them at a very low cost to keep them in this low category. The medium or what's called rising risk, that's the in, those are the individuals that probably have a chronic condition or may be, for example, pre-diabetic. That population is anywhere from 15 to 35% of the uninsured 
uh, generally with one or more chronic conditions. And the idea here, again, under population health, and, and is to, to try and keep them from moving up into this high risk category where they have multiple conditions and they're, they require a great deal of attention. So we're taking our case management function and putting it in here and we just on Wednesday um, worked with the local federally qualified health clinic to open another location in the East Altamont Springs area where there's been no clinic and there's a high demand area because we map the hot spots of Seminole County and we know that that's one of the areas where we need help. The nice part about a federally qualified health clinic, Shepherd's Hope is episodic care. It's care when you walk in, you're uninsured, they take care of you, they're volunteer physicians. This one, these FQHCs are clinics. They have pharmacy, they have radiology services, primary care services, behavioral health. So we're gonna put one in the Altamont area to begin to allow us to address those individuals that have those chronic conditions. The whole idea being keeping them out of this category up here, which accounts for on an average five to 10% of the uninsured sit up there. Who delivers your behavioral health in that model? Um, right now, um, in the FQHCs, they're putting licensed social workers into the FQHCs. I met on uh, Tuesday with the um, Brevard Health Alliance, which is the FQHCs for Brevard County, um, and they're moving, they're, they're tomorrow, Monday rather, of this week, they're gonna try and recruit their first psychiatrist into the Titusville area. They've never had one up there. Right now what they're doing is they're looking at telepsych because they're not in a situation where they can necessarily staff all of the needs. And so what they're doing is looking at a, a psychiatrist via telehealth, whether you've got a monitor and where you can sit down and, and um, speak with them. That's been very successful in South Carolina where they've actually been able to put those programs into the hospital emergency departments and they have a psychiatrist on call for the state of South Carolina at all times, they rotate that schedule. And when you come in there, and if you're in a situation where you're having a crisis mode, they can interact with you and it's supposed to offload, it, it reduces the offload times for EMS, for the sheriff's office and others that are involved in that. Um, so that's, that's the answer right now. Now, um, the Seminole Behavioral Health, which was the safety net provider in Seminole County, just merged with Lakeside, Lakeside Behavioral Health in Orange and one other, and so they're, it's now called Aspire, and they're also looking at this as an overall problem or, or ways to come up with a solution. Traditionally, behavioral health, um, the hospital that I used to be vice president for, that we were talking about before, for-profit, and then sold to part of Orlando Health, has inpatient psychiatric services, behavioral health services. Um, that was my interaction more so, um, but what we're trying to do now, I'm the chair of the managing entity for the four counties. So every, uh, for the uh, individuals that have to access the safety network for behavioral health, $58 million a year flows from the Department of Children and Family Services into the managing entity, this local office, and then we parcel that out to other providers. And we're trying to take a look at how do we move behavioral health from a, if you will, a separate track over here into, uh, combine it into the patient-centered medical home or the primary delivery model. So, I, and, and it sounded, I can't remember all the specialties that you were bringing in. Proudest of that. Proudest of having added a licensed clinical social worker very recently. This opportunity happened. I said, "This." I realize how often I'm interfacing with crisis or the need to deal with very stressful problems, and this would be an asset to really free me up and help these people move. Before you put the mic down, um, I'm told. And, and I, I mean, I'm from the FQHCs and others that we've been working in this area, that upwards of 60% of the individuals with at least one or two chronic diseases have probably some behavioral health component as well. So if you've got a practice that has a high degree of geriatrics or individuals with multiple chronic conditions, that's probably the ones that you're seeing. So, okay, good, good. Um, the next area, let's talk about uh, better care for individuals. We've talked a lot about population health. In fact, we've talked about it for almost the entire time. Let's move over to the patient experience. Um, we talked about um, the opportunity to look at performance measures. The first area is high service quality, which Bob, you were pointing out as one of the differentiators that your practice has versus some of these other practices. 
So some of the things that physicians are measuring in that area um, that are, they're looking at to improve this patient experience, the second element, um, are the service categories, timeliness and convenience. Can I get to see Bob on the same day that I have a problem? There's a number of electronic tools now. There's me visit out of, uh, developed out of, I think it was Georgia somewhere, a physician who developed a program uh, to provide communication, rapid communication electronically, HIPAA compliant, that allows his patients to communicate with him, with his practice, pretty much any hour of the day or night. And some of the concierge practices are doing that currently. Um, so the idea is to improve the ability to get in quickly um, and the convenience of that. Personal attention, uh, just what you were sharing. Reliability and dependability, the practice is there, it's, it's open when I need it. One of the things that I did locally with the group that I was working with, the primary care group, is we had at the time in the service area nine what do we call retail health clinics, minute clinics, little neighborhood clinics, and um, take care clinics. Uh, I think they've changed the name, but uh, the ones at Walgreens. So I went out and I met with all the nurse practitioners in those practices. And I said, okay, that's who runs those. And they're very defined in terms of what they can do. And a lot of physicians view them as competitors and they're basically skimming the cream off the top. You know, if I need a sports physical, instead of going to see my primary care now, I, I go to the, that place and, and get a nurse practitioner to do it and, and that's it. Um, and so I did have that discussion with our primary care physicians in the group, but what we did is we said, wait a minute, there's a protocol. The day that I was in one of these practices waiting to see the nurse practitioner, a woman walked in with her daughter, says, I need a school physical. The first question the nurse practitioner asked, um, any history of seizures? Uh, oh, well, you know what? Yeah, when she was, sorry, I can't see you. You need to go see a primary care physician. They won't see anybody that's had a seizure for that, okay? so. Uh, that's out of their protocol. So what I did is I sat down and I said, okay, so all of these things that aren't things that you can cover, what do you do? Oh, we just turn around and we send them or we say they have to go see their primary care doctor. Suppose they don't have one. So we set up a back line number at our practices, gave it to them, said just call this number or refer the patient right to here. We'll get them in right away and here's the fixed price that we have for you know this kind of stuff. And we started getting referrals from all of these retail health clinics. So what we did is we provided a service that they couldn't get there over in our practices. At the same time at night, our physicians, and they weren't always keen about this, but if it was something they could pretty well tell it was minor, they quite often would say, here's the nearest retail health clinic to you. So we were in a situation where we worked together. So this whole reliability, dependability, or coordination, if you will. Um, competence and professionalism of the employees in the practice, particularly as we expand the teams, empathy, responsiveness, and the tangibles, uh, the office location itself. I remember walking in when I used to develop physician networks in the community, walking in and finding, you know, a, I remember one particular, they had a fish tank and there's a dead fish floating in the tank in the, in the waiting room. So, you know, better not to have the tank at all if those are the circumstances. Now, aside from the service quality, you also have improving the outcomes. And this is where we were talking earlier about HEDIS. The health plans are ranked, and they rank higher if they make sure that their, their members under that health plan are receiving a certain level of services, preventive services. Um, the HEDIS, just to give you an idea, among some of the things they look at now are asthma medication use, persistence of beta blocker treatment after a heart attack, controlling high blood pressure, comprehensive diabetes care, childhood and adolescent immunization status, and those are things that are measured. I went into a practice about uh, four years ago that I'd not been in that office, and I stepped around behind the desk and there was this stack of these big thick envelopes from one of the health plans. So I started opening them and they were all the HEDIS reports indicating these are all your patients who have not received this, this, and this, and whoever had been in there before me had not even looked at them. So they were sitting there and it, happened to be the next day where the practice administrator in another location called me and said, you know what, something's wrong because we just got heard from the insurance company that, that none of these things are being addressed. And they were about six months worth of these things stacked up. So the, the plans are monitoring that because they, it, they rely on that to get good scores, which means more for them in terms of being licensed to serve a particular area, provide that coverage. So. Um, and then the third area, anything else on service quality or anything, Bob, in your experience you wanted to mention? Or? Okay. The third area is the, low, the uh, per capita cost. 
And uh, part of that is, how do you reduce the operating costs? This is what we were talking about on the GPO earlier, when we were talking about supplies or you being able to say, to go into a practice and be able to find savings on office supplies, which they may not realize were there. And so in, in small offices, um, I was sharing with David that we're, we have an agreement with uh, Premier and Alliant GPO that we offer free to practices to basically allow them to buy through those GPOs at a fraction of uh, or considerable savings of what they've been paying. And we did that because we had so many practices that were looking for a way to reduce their cost. Another one is smaller office footprint. Now, you know, you've got a lot of new people coming through, so I'm sure you probably got the office space that you had. There are some practices now that are using electronic means to um, take appointments. So for example, this started with a, a program called Hello Health in Brooklyn, I think was the first place I heard about it. Hello Health, and then they sold their, uh, their online system to a company up in Canada, and I had some discussions with them at the time. Hello Health, when you would call, instead of calling Bob's office to make an appointment, you go online and you select what it is that you need to come in to see Bob for, and you go ahead and you run your credit card, so you're paying for everything in advance. Now, if you don't show up, Bob's still getting paid because you did it by credit card on Hello Health. And Hello Health, because they don't need a big billing team, it is a cash practice, has basically shrunk their staff. They don't need all the billing and others that they needed for insurance. And so, and they know you're coming in because you've already made appointment online, so they don't have anybody that they need in the front office. When you go in, it actually makes, flashes a little light in the back and they know that you're there. So you have basically a very small footprint. Uh, for the practice I was working with, we developed a 400 square foot practice that we could put into an A office building because we designed the plumbing so it was back to back. And so you basically had a small reception area for this. Then you had the exam room, you had a break room for the team, and, what's, and you had bathroom. So you had those four things built into this little 400 square foot. So obviously it brings your cost down and it enables us to put a practice in other locations where we might not otherwise have had it. <clears throat> Speaking of that now too, there is a thing um, out of Ohio, um, and I'm trying to remember the name of the company, and it's a shell, and they can put it in a lobby or something else, and you walk up to it, you check in on the computer, there is somebody there, you step inside, and it's all telehealth that you see the individual patient um, and, uh, and the physician, and if they need your pulse oximetry, they go ahead and push a button on their keyboard, and a little door pops open, and there's the pulse oximeter, and they tell you to put it on, and it's all, and then afterward, when you leave the shell, you close the door and they hit a button and it's got the ultra whatever that, that basically sanitizes the whole unit. They replace the probe covers and everything and they're ready for the next patient. That's uh, out of Aurora, Ohio. Uh, one of our very prominent uh, grocery stores near has uh, a new Haji, which is a patient monitoring more advanced than the blood pressure, mm -hmm. uh, will do body comp. I think it does uh, oxygen sat. And you can email this to your doctor. Uh, it will not take your blood pressure until you have been properly seated for a length of time, which doesn't always get observed yeah. in many settings. Uh, and uh, then when completed, we'll transmit the data wherever you like. I'll uh, tell you who's using that down here, you may not know them, but Rosen Resorts. In Rosen Resorts, they have a bunch of hotels down here. They have their own medical clinic. Um, they spend $14 million a year on providing medical care to their employees and their um, uh, family members. Very unique situation. Um, they have some of the largest hotels down around the convention center, the Rosen properties. <clears throat> but what they're doing now is at each hotel, they're putting one of those units in and each employee runs their ID card through so it keeps their own record so they can go back and look. They can download their pedometer into the system so they can see how many steps they've walked that day um, and it really allows them individually and because of the way their system is set up, if something shows up where they do have high blood pressure today, they've identified into that system and the medical operation is, operates separate from the employer strategy. I'm not sure how they do this, but they know that uh, Bob needs help and they'll call Bob and say, we're sending a truck over to your hotel, please we'll, you know, come on back and we want to see you today. So literally, again, it's that uh, you know, proactive type approach. 
Um, there are organizations and practices with no insurance billing. We talked about concierge uh, practices, the direct physician care that you mentioned, Bob, before. Uh, some sharing services and space, you know, are there ways, again, to reduce cost? There was a practice a few years ago that opened in the back of an uh, optometric shop, took over a couple of rooms back there and ran a family practice out of the back of that. So the low-cost alternatives, direct care, as we talked about, some way that Bob can contract directly to provide service where he doesn't have to go through an insurance component. Uh, we talked about team treatment, uh, e-triage. I had shared with David before that I have an e-triage system on here developed by the company that does all of the veteran administration triage system nationwide. As a physician over in Rockledge, Melbourne area. Um, and within 60 to 90 seconds, I won't, I, it doesn't diagnose, but it triages for me what I probably have, where of seven locations I need to go, how quickly I need to get there, what I need to do in the meantime, and oh, by the way, here's a report that I can share with the physician that'll show me how I answered all of the triage questions. Um, have you familiar with freemd.com? Take a look at that, freemd.com when you get home. And you'll see the owner of this company that I'm talking about, Dr. Steven Schuler, and he's got 11,500 videos. And when you go out to FreeMD and answer the questions, you'll, he'll ask you the questions. The computer's doing all the same determination in the background. It'd be interesting for you to take a look at it. Um, email visits, um, again, providing you've got HIPAA compliant. Uh, I mentioned incorporating the retail health clinics and the telehealth area as well. There is a physician right now in the Satellite Beach area who's working with the national retail pharmacies and they're indicating that within about a two to three year window when you walk into a retail health clinic, if the nurse practitioner says, you know what, um, I, you're getting an odd reading here, let's get the cardiologist involved. They'll turn around, click a button, and up will come the cardiologist on the telehealth screen and the uh, full telemetry video and audio, and they'll be telling the nurse practitioner, okay, you need to do this, you need to do that. They become the arms, if you will, of the physician at a central location providing telehealth for specialty services. Um, so I think we're going to see that move fairly rapidly. The issue right now is the um, reimbursement, because if Bob were to do telehealth, he, he can't charge for that right now in the state of Florida. And what we're trying to do is get to the point where he will be able to do that, whether he sees a patient face-to-face -face or through his monitoring system that you were talking about or something before. And the last thing I wanted to share, and we've got a, like a minute left, is just um, providing proactive treatment using health risk assessments. That's what we're going to put into Seminole County where we're doing a quick summary of what are the health conditions so we can determine where they fit, low, medium, or high on their acuity. Uh, automatic preventive service orders. There's a doctor down south, and if you're interested, let me know. He's got it set up where his staff automatically reviews every time before a patient comes in what they've had done that's on the preventive recommendation and then the staff has the right to put that in the chart as an order which the physician then signs off on. You may already be doing that. Well that's it. Uh, thank you both for uh, joining us and um, you know hopefully we got some good information out of that on Triple AIM.